Howdy. So the final thing that we want to do is basically show a different way to apply Neumann's rule. And this approach is called Fumi's method. This is, um, in some cases, it might be a little bit easier approach, uh, easier way to think about the problem. Uh, if you're comfortable using the approach we just worked through, uh, then you can do that as well. Um, I should note ahead of time, Fumi's method does not work with hexagonal or trigonal structures. Um, so we're just going to think about a, a general, you know, maybe monoclinic, triclinic. It works with all the other cases. Um, so we're going to work through the same exact uh, example uh, that we worked through initially. Um, and that is considering a single fourfold rotation around lattice vector U1. Um, and Fumi's method basically points out that the relationship between these elements of uh, the transformed and the original tensor um, have to follow uh, the same relationship um, that the product xi times xj uh, and xi prime xj prime equal. So what does that mean? OK, you're about to find out. Um, xi xj, xi prime xj prime. This is basically saying if we track what a single point in space does uh, in response to this uh, symmetry operation, um, we can use that transformation um, to keep track of the elements within the tensor matrix. So let's see what this looks like. Um, and I'm basically going to think about it step by step, and there are three main steps. Um, the first one is for the particular system you're looking at, let's identify the symmetry of the structure. What, um, what rotation or what, what symmetry operation are we focusing on? Uh, and we already defined that, right? So coming in, we said we have a single fourfold rotation around UI. And so that's all we're going to think about here for this particular example. The next step is to identify the coordinate mapping. Um, so if I think about a transformation of a single point, um, how do I write that transformation in terms of the original coordinates? So again, let's start off with a general point, um, and it's going to be called x1, x2, x3. So each of these are, uh, you know, the, the position of that point with respect to some principal lattice vector. Um, and again, because we're talking about a fourfold rotation around lattice vector u1, um, this point is going to rotate 90 degrees counterclockwise, and it'll end up at some new position here. So again, x prime one, x two prime, x three prime, these are all the transformed um, coordinates of this point after we've done a 90 degree rotation around lattice vector U1. Um, okay, so what is this point in terms of the original, um, uh, the original position? And so because it's a fourfold rotation, you know, I, I know that um, the position in terms of last vector u1 is not going to change. So x1 prime simply equals x1. Um, I'm a fourfold rotation, so only my uh, y and z positions are going to change. So the new uh, value of x2, x2 prime, is going to be equal to the negative of the original value of x3. And this is just coming back from the same old fourfold rotation matrix. If I start off at some point down here, I rotate up 90 degrees. Um, and so that original uh, component uh, along uh, lattice vector E2 is now projecting along lattice vector uh, E3. Um, and what was originally the, the projection along lattice vector E3 is now projecting in the negative sense along lattice vector E2. So the new position x2 prime is simply the original negative x3. Uh, similarly, the new position x3 uh, is given by the original x2. Uh, and so if this is confusing you, just go back to your original um, when we were working through fourfold uh, rotation matrices. Um, and put uh, 90 degrees in that rotation angle, and you should return these values. So this is what I mean by uh, identifying the coordinate mapping. What is this new position in terms of the original uh, coordinates? Um, so the next thing that we need to do is basically realize that you know this relationship between Aij prime and Aij 
are given by the same relationship between the products of these xi prime, xj prime, and xi, j, xi, uh, xi, xj. So let's go ahead and write all of these. I'm gonna take that same information I had before. So again, the most important thing that I'm carrying over uh, is um, this uh, relationship um, uh, between the transform coordinate and the original um, coordinate system. Um, so by write all of the relationships, all I mean is write down um, this for every single combination of i from one to three and from j to one to three. And that's all I've done here. So all this is is, you know, there is some relationship between xi, xj and uh, xi prime, xj prime, where in this case i equals one and j also equals one. Um, so all of these indices are the same on either sides. But we know how to write these new positions in terms of the original coordinates. And so let's go ahead and do that. So for example, x1 prime equals x1. So x1 prime, x1 prime is the same as x1 times x1. Um, similarly, x2 is negative x3. So x1 prime is again x1, but x2 is now given by negative x3. So all I'm doing here is I'm, you know, uh, I'm writing the transform coordinate in terms of the original uh, components of the coordinates. Um, and this allows me to now build up this relationship because Fumi's rule basically states that the relationship between aij prime and aij, that is the um, components in the untransformed tensor and the components in the transformed tensor, have to be the same as the relationship uh, between uh, these two guys, between this and this term. And so all I'm doing here is I'm keeping my indices the same, i's and j's, and I'm rewriting this relationship off to the right. So for example, here I have x1, x2, and I can rewrite that as sigma one, sigma two, um, and it has to be equal to negative x1, next, negative x3. So that means that sigma one, two has to be equal to negative sigma one, three. And so this is what I mean by the relationships between AIJ prime and AIJ must follow the relationships between the product XI prime, XJ prime, and XI, XJ. Um, so again, this is a little bit confusing. Let's back up and let's just hit this one more time. Remember there are three steps. The first one in this case was already given to us. We said we're gonna focus on a single uh, fourfold rotation axis. The second step is rewrite um, the relationship between some original point and some new point that has undergone the particular transformation that we're focusing on. And so in this case, we started off with x1, x2, x3. We performed a 90 degree rotation around uh, the principal last vector u1. That brings us up here. And what I want to do is I want to rewrite each of these uh, positions because x1 prime, x2 prime, x3 prime, this is basically the position of some point after I've performed a transformation operation on it. And we want to rewrite it in terms of the um, original um, uh, components of the position of that point. And so once I have this relationship here, I can then write out all of my xi, xj terms, and then I can substitute in um, for the xi prime, xj prime, I can bring it back to uh, being able to relate that to the original coordinate position. So I've done that here, and then all I've done is I've, I've said that whatever applies to xi, xj um, and xi, xj prime has to also apply to sigma ij prime sigma ij. Um, so for example, x3, x1, that'll bring me to sigma 3, 1, and that the relationship between this guy and this guy has to be the same as the relationship between this guy and this guy. So sigma 3, 1 equals sigma 2, 1. Okay, so if you saw the original um, example uh, working through Neumann's rule, from this part out, it's all repeating there because this list that I have is the same list that I attained 
using the sort of standard Neumann's method. So Fumi's rule only is just a different way to get to this point. Again, you can choose whichever method makes more sense to you. Um, all I've done is I've taken this table here, I've shifted it over to the left, and just for completion, I can tell a, I can walk through what this what effect this has on constraining uh, the elements of the rank two tensor that we're interested in. Um, but again, this is going to be exactly the same as the original um, example that we applied for Neumann's rule. Neumann's rule. Um, so sigma one equals sigma one one. That does not apply any additional constraints. But if I get to a case like this, sigma one two equals minus sigma one three but sigma 1, 3 equals positive sigma 1, 2, the only way that this can hold is if sigma 1, 3 equals 0. All I'm doing is I'm taking this value, uh, you know, sigma 1, 2 equals this term. I'm plugging sigma 1, 2 up here. That gives me sigma 1, 3 equals negative sigma 1, 3. The only way that can be true is if sigma 1, 3 equals 0. And following either of these relationships, if sigma 1, 3 equals 0, then sigma 1, 2 also equals 0. And so that has given me zeros for the top two uh, elements uh, of the tensor. Similarly, sigma 2, 1 equals minus sigma 3, 1, but sigma 3, 1 equals positive sigma 2, 1. Um, if I substitute one expression in for the other, that gives me positive sigma 3, 1 equals negative sigma 3, 1. And the only way that can be true is if sigma 3, 1 equals 0. And therefore, sigma 2, 1 also has to equal 0. Um, I see two additional constraints, sigma 2, 3 equals minus sigma 3, 2. Um, this doesn't cancel out. Um, all it does is it says that the value here is opposite in sign of the value uh, down here. And the final constraint is that sigma 2, 2 equals sigma 3, 3. This is basically saying the same thing. Um, and so I can choose either term to express it in terms of, but I'm reducing one additional variable. So my original... Uh, tensor, which had nine independent elements, um, gets reduced down dramatically to having one, two, three independent elements. This value here is pinned to the equal the same as this value. This value here is opposite in sign of this value. Um, so again, that was an example of the application of Fumi's method. It's basically an alternative method to applying Neumann's rule. Whichever one makes more sense, um, I would recommend you use that one.